Good afternoon, everybody. And, and welcome to Homecoming, and welcome to GridX 2022. I know there's still a number of people coming in from that beautiful weather outside. Uh, it's great to see you here this afternoon in the recital hall. Beautiful stage, isn't it? And uh, I did some checking. Um, this is one of the original five or six buildings of our campus from like late 60s, early 70s. I see Dean Moffat nodding. So there's a lot of history in this building. Um, I'm Carl Steiner. I serve as the Vice President for Research and Creative Achievement here on campus, and I'm really pleased to welcome all of you. Uh, and in this position, I just have to do a quick shout out. I'm really pleased that early this year in February, our institution was designated by the Carnegie Foundation as a research category one institution. Uh, Come on. And with that, we are joining only 145 other universities in the country in this top tier recognition as a research one institution. And yes, only one of three in Maryland. You heard of this little private institution up the road, right? Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland at College Park. So we are in really, really good company. We're very proud of, of uh, the UMBC history, but also of the UMBC future. So today is GridX Day. I'm really glad that you are here. We initially conceived and launched GridX as part of the 50th anniversary a celebration for our campus. And I realized that is six years ago, so it's time for us to start thinking about the 60th celebration. You know, it always takes a few years to do all that. The goal of GridX is to really give you a look behind the scenes, a sneak peek uh, of some of the exciting and impactful research and creative achievement initiatives across our campus. Presented by a selection of our faculty and by a selection of our outstanding alumni. I don't want to go give all the secrets away of what they're going to be talking about. You will find that when, when they talk themselves. But a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will have three sessions. Uh, each session is about a half an hour long. Then we have a 10, 15 minute break in between to mic up the next set of speakers. Then there's another half an hour session, 10, 15 minute break, and another half an hour session. So we are hoping that you will stay with us for the whole two hours, but if some of you need to run in and out, we can understand that as well. Uh, and so I know you will enjoy the presentations, but I can assure you, if you stay the whole time, you will learn something today. And since we're in an academic institution, that's a big part of what we do. So with that, I uh, want to kick off GridX and introduce you to our first moderator. That's uh, Dr. Keith Bowman, who is the Dean of the College of Engineering and Information Technology. Keith. Thank you. Good afternoon. I said, good afternoon. OK, thank you so much. I'm Keith Bowman. I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering and IT. Our first speaker, Dalali Jarasa, is a 2004 graduate in computer engineering. He's in about the first 100 graduates um, with that degree from UMBC. There's been about 800 so far. Dalali's president of Fearless Solutions, a full-stack digital services firm with a mission to create software with a soul. To me, projects like their work for the Searchable Museum for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History are demonstrations of accessible, meaningful technology that changes the way people view history and technology. He's also the founder and lead coach of the Hutch Digital Services Incubator, which aims to nurture, empower, and connect underrepresented entrepreneurs who are working toward the public good. He's also the CEO and founder of Fearless Sports, an apparel company with a mission to ignite, equip, and uniform the impactful. Though he lives in Baltimore City with his wife, Letitia Jarasa, who is my health commissioner in Baltimore City, and he is our kickoff speaker for this year's Grit X. I think what he'll share with you today is how he and colleagues are changing the way we might think about the divisions, technical and otherwise, that we need to bridge in the world. Dalawi Jarasa. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for that warm introduction. Uh, when Carl asked me to speak, he said he was interested in completing the Jurassa trifecta. I'm the third Jurassa to speak here. Uh, I wish we could say we saved the best for last, but my wife uh, gets that distinction. Uh, so I'll come in number two. Sorry, Kof. Um But I, I think about how we're connected. I, I think about everyone in this room and how we share the love for this institution of UMBC. But despite all these connections that we have, uh, there's so much in this digital world that seeks to tear us apart. But I think we've got a different choice we're able to make. 
we're able to think about these experiences in a way to both drive education and to bring us together as people. And that was evident in our experience with the National Museum of African American History and Culture when the Smithsonian asked us to take their slavery and freedom exhibit online. Now, you've got to understand the context of what was happening in this space. We're in the height of the global pandemic. It's 2020. There's no vaccine yet. Everyone is at home. Everyone's scared. Case counts are rising. Death tolls are rising. We're glued to our TV, not sure what's happening next. In the midst of that, we're watching TV and we're, wa we're witnessing an unarmed black man be murdered. George Floyd's death rocked the nation. Protests erupting everywhere. We're having conversations about social justice. We're having conversations about how Africans, Americans have been treated today and in the past. It is that backdrop in which we are creating this experience. And so we knew in that moment we had to tell a very compelling story. We knew in that moment we had to do something that was world class that would speak to the moment in which we're in. Let's take a look at what we built. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. begin to think about experiences that bring us together and really we came to three fundamental pill pillars of how we deliver this project. First, expanding access. Second, designing in context. And third, ensuring that empathy was at the forefront. You can imagine, we won the contract, it's a national competition, we're excited, and we're thinking about the VR headsets that we're going to put on and how we're going to walk virtually through this museum. And the museum curators in their infinite wisdom are like, slow down. We want to make sure everyone has the ability around the world to access the site. See, less than 6% of the internet population globally has access to a VR headset, and so the barrier is too large. We knew we had to target smartphones. We knew we had to target desktop computers and everything in between. The average person that goes to the museum is above the age of 50, with the majority of them being 60 to 90 years old. So there's a huge opportunity to bring in a whole new demographic for the museum. Typically with a project like this, you target on the product adoption curve the innovators and the early adopters on the left side of the curve. You want those that are excited, they want to be the first to get a product, the first to tell their friends, first in line for absolutely everything. However, when you're thinking about increasing access and you want to move really quickly, you've got to keep the people on the right in mind. The late majority and the laggers. Grandma's got to be able to use the site too. And so we had four primary targets with this project. Students K through 12, educators, lifelong learners, and families. Once we thought about increasing access, it was about how do we design for them in context. People are going to be reaching the site from around the world. They may have various bandwidth levels. We're not sure what device they're using. And so taking advantage of progressive web applications and responsive designs, which are techniques that allow you to scale your application up and down to meet the device where it is, when it is needed, is important. And that's how we built this application. Not only that, as we enter the museum space, you're physically entering into an elevator and you start progressing down through time. You hear Maya Angelou speaking. You saw a clip of that in our video a few minutes earlier. Once you get to the bottom floor of the museum, it's almost as if you've been transplanted in time to the bottom of a slave ship. You're walking through. You're learning more about the Atlantic slave trade. You're learning more about the Middle Passage and all of the slaves that lost their lives along the way. And this is heavy stuff. You need a place to decompress. You need a place to think about it, a, think, a place to process. And so the museum has this beautiful court in which you can go and just contemplate. And a lot of people go there and they're just quiet. Some people go there, they sing. Some people talk with their families. And so how do you go about recreating a space like this online? See, when you go to DC, you may have waited months to get your ticket. Perhaps you travel there, you bought a plane ticket, you have a hotel room, you stand in line again outside to get in, 
Many people spend multiple days at the museum. When they come to your website, they can leave in half a second. The average user will leave your site if it doesn't load in three seconds. So in reality, we cannot recreate this experience. But we can meet the intent. And the intent is give a place where people can learn and become educated, take in the information and decompress as they need it. So the site was chopped up into books, into chapters. People were able to explore via the Constellation Explorer and how things relate to one another. They were able to explore via timeline. Take in a piece, reflect. Take in a piece, reflect. Through this Constellation Viewer, you're able to humanize people and really build empathy. As we see Harriet Tubman's Shaw here. And as large as life as Harriet Tubman was, this is a reminder that she got cold. She put on her clothes just like everybody else. As she sung Negro spirituals, go down Moses, to signify to other slaves that want to join her on the journey, we see that how it relates to the Fisk Jubilee Singers that took that same genre and made it much more widely used. These spirituals that talk to two things simultaneously, the pain and the struggle of today while grasping onto the hope of tomorrow. And we built empathy for those that lived in this space. The Point of Pine Slave Cabin from South Carolina. We are able to explore this. When you go to the physical museum, there is a physical structure. You can't go inside. And so the things that we're able to take advantage of in the digital space that we cannot do in person, this 318 square foot space, think of it more like a pen, where you would keep your animals and your hogs because these slaves were property. And to know that 10 to 12 at a time were in this structure, if you can walk inside and span it and see what that felt like after a long day's work to be piled up on top of other people, and you start to understand this plight, you start to feel it and build empathy. So as we create these digital experiences, yes, keep empathy on the forefront. Understand the context and build for people where they are and ensure that access is forefront in mind. When this site was released in November of 2021, we had gone from almost half the population visiting the museum 50 and up to 16 to 65, 10 to 20 percent in every major demographic across the world. 140 countries in the world within six months had accessed this experience. That is 70 percent of the countries in the world. We were nominated for and were awardee of a Webby one of the top five in its category, which is synonymous to an Oscar for the internet, so that's pretty a big deal. One of the top five sites in the world in its category. And so yes, we've got a choice to build experiences that bring us together. And our hope in the future is many of you will join us on this journey to help build software with the soul and help create a world where good software powers things that matter. Thank you. Thank you, Delali. Professor Vandana Jandeja is a professor and chair of information systems, which is the largest producer of bachelor's degrees at UMBC, between the BS degree in information systems and the BA degree in business technology administration. Currently, about one out of five UMBC graduate students are in IS, gradu are in IS graduate, uh, UMBC graduate students are in IS programs. Dr. Jandeja's research is a, has a focus on data mining and data heterogeneity. Her data science work brings together important societal topics such as climate change, ethics and data science, misinformation detection, and security. Five years ago, when I joined, Dr. When I joined UMBC, Dr. Janeja was on leave as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at NSF. I remember our meetings quite well because she came back to UMBC to meet with me. She talked at that time about data science and dreams she had for how data science could have a stronger place at UMBC. She also talked about applications of data science that would have impact. Today, she is chair of information systems, but she is here today in her role as director of an exciting NSF institute called IHARP. It is one of five institutes founded a year ago under the category of harnessing the data revolution. It brings together data scientists, earth scientists, and other colleagues to work on understanding the polar regions of the Earth and the impacts of climate change. I have met many investigators 
and is a true research collider populated with different backgrounds, cultures, and academic disciplines. In my experience, these collisions can produce chaos or they can produce synergy. As they head towards the end of their first year together, it is clearly on track towards synergy under her leadership. She's going to tell you all about it. Please welcome Dr. Janeja. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we all are surrounded by data. We are living in a data revolution. And I'm here to talk to you today about how we can use this data revolution and the deluge of data that we are living in to perhaps tame the deluge in the sea levels. As director of the NSF HDR Institute, these are exactly the questions that we are trying to tackle and address, looking at the model and data revolution in our polar regions. Now, looking at several examples that you may have seen around you, some examples pop up right away. You may have seen images such as these, where the foreign minister of Tuvalu was standing in the middle of the water giving a speech for COP26. This was a poignant, poignant image that resonated with many of us. This was land where people lived and now surrounded by water. Closer to home in the United States, some of you may remember this image from the Yellowstone National Park where there was a flood which was supposed to be a thousand year event where the northern region of the park was closed and eventually the entire park was closed. And even more closer to home, we have seen things in Maryland. We have seen things in Crisfield, where the land is sinking. We have seen things in Ellicott City, where we have seen multiple hundred year, thousand year events. And these are not called thousand year events because they happen once in thousand years. There's a very, very low probability of happening, but they're happening more and more often. And if you look closely at the Society of Concerned Scientists and their research, you will see that many of our communities could be covered in water and could be deluged by water by 2035. So looking at this, there's a deep concern that we all may share and understand how do we address this climate change aspect. And I'm going to specifically talk about the sea level rise and how we are addressing that. If you look at the Arctic and Antarctic regions, which are covered by ice sheet and ice mass, majority of our freshwater resources are there, but they are melting. The glaciers are melting, there's ice shelves that are breaking off, they're going into the water. And as more and more of these events happen, the sea level rises. If you look at some of the predictions, they have a very wide range. The best estimate is 0.6 meters. But the range goes anywhere from 20 centimeters to two, two meters. That's a very big range for any, any policymaker to make a decision on what can we do to address these issues and how can we impact our communities, how can we shore up defenses in the communities. This is where our research comes in. Using data science and AI models, working very closely with polar scientists, can we harness the data to have better predictions? This is truly a place where data science and AI can have an impact. But as you can imagine, this is a very complex system as well. Lots of data, lots of heterogeneity. Let me tell you a little bit more about that. If you look at the ice sheets in any of the you know, polar regions, Arctic or Antarctic, there is ice mass, which is the ice sheet. There is sea ice. There is ice in the middle of the ocean, lots of different elements at play. If I just look at the ice sheet on the land mass, many things could be happening there. There could be the atmospheric factors affecting the sea mass or the ice mass. There could be melt on the surface, which gets into runoff and discharge into the water. And as those things happen, several different things start coming into play. Many complex dynamics start coming into play. How do these subcomponents and components interact with each other? And the reality is that there are many, many different scientists specializing in each of these areas, and we have to bring them all together. So it's not just an element of science bringing together the data, but also bringing together the data scientists and the polar scientists who are looking at these different parts. So clearly, there is a lot of opportunity for harnessing the data, but an opportunity of bringing people together as well from different domains. There's lots of multi-complex systems that we can bring together with data science and AI. So keeping this in mind, how do we understand these interaction components? And how do we, at the end of the day, have a better prediction and more certainty in predicting the sea level rise? As you can imagine, there are many challenges. There may be a lot of data. We all have a lot of data. But is that data adequate? Is it labeled well enough? Is it heterogeneous? How do we bring it all together? How do we make sense of it when we bring it together? Are there situations where we need domain experts to help us even understand the basic features, which is what we are seeing in reality. 
And then once we find the patterns and we find the results, how do we validate it with all of these different domain experts that may be involved, having conversations across these teams as well. So as you can imagine, there are different data sets, there are different architectures, the way the data is generated. And when we come into the models, there's also the question of how are we creating these models? How are we setting these parameters? Maybe we need to learn the parameters, right? So all of these things have to be brought into the fore to do the research. So we have a lot of tools in our toolbox, but we have to choose the right tool to hit the nail on the head. Do we have a big hammer or a small hammer? What do we pick for some of these things? That will depend on factors such as whether the data is small or very large. It will also depend on factors such as whether the data is uniform, well-defined, or is it heterogeneous. And then based on that, we can decide the types of models we can pick from data science and AI, whether it's a simple analysis or whether we use more involved deep learning methods. And we are using all of these. And I'm, I'm going to talk about a few examples in here as well. There's a key thing that we have to understand when we are looking at any geospatial phenomena. When we talk about the melting ice sheets or the ocean, there is space involved and there is time involved. And this is where the importance of space comes in. In this picture, you'll see the sensors that are placed in the equatorial Pacific region, buoys that are measuring sea surface temperature. And if I look at all of them together, I can say that there's this one anomalous point that looks out of place in terms of the sea surface temperature. But in reality, what may be happening is there could be a spatial phenomena there at place, which is actually, if you dig, dig deeper into it, you will see that there may be oscillations that are happening because of which these anomalies are happening. So the importance of space is very critical. Where you live impacts your health, for example. The same way where you are in the water, where you are in the ocean, where you are on the ice mass impacts how you study that land. The same way what time period are you in also impacts how you study it. So for example, if we look at the same data from the sensors and we look at it over a period of time, there may be patterns emerging in some time steps which deviate in other time steps and they come back. So it's like the oscillation. This example is from the oscillations in the ocean in the equatorial Pacific region. So the same way we have to uh, emulate this in the ice, ice sheet area as well. So looking at this, if we consider examples of what we can do in the region in terms of data science and AI, once we are able to divide this data in terms of space and time, that's where we can ha start having meaningful discovery because now the space is well defined and we can understand that this space behaves similarly as compared to the other space. And these are the phenomena present here versus elsewhere. One example is if you look at the Greenland ice sheet, the central Greenland behaves very different from the, the coastal Greenland because there's more melt happening on the coastal Greenland. So that's why this, is, this becomes very critical. But once we do this, we can start identifying a lot of interesting patterns. We can start identifying hotspots, such as cracks forming on the ice. We can start finding relationships across domains. So what's happening in atmospherics? What's happening in hydrology? How are they related to each other? So each domain, once we define it well, we can find patterns in that domain and start making linkages, studying overlaps and proximity. This anomaly is happening at this spot, at this time period, this is how they are related. So that's where the, the really exciting science starts happening. One example that we started looking at is in terms of the Antarctic um, ice sheet. And we saw that when we looked at anomalies in the sea ice, in the western region of the Antarctic, we found some unusual things happening over a period of time in a seasonal manner. And interestingly, these simple discords that we found or anomalies that we found also corroborated stuff that has, that has been studied by the domain sciences. So this is kind of a first step for us to make sure that our models are working, we are able to replicate the phenomena and identify the phenomena that some of the other domain sciences are also seeing. And this is an exciting discovery for us as well. One other example I'll give you is on the Greenland ice sheet. There are thousands of flights that go over the Greenland region on these flight paths, and they take radar images. These images look something like this, where they're looking at the end glacial images or the cross section of the ice. And each of these lines indicates how the ice formed or how the ice sheet formed. If you can trace all of these lines in the image, you can actually trace it back to the ice age in some cases. This is where data science and AI can help as well, especially computer vision, where you can take subsets of these images, label these image layers, and stitch them together to understand how the ice bed is forming. Where are the layers well-defined? Where are the layers melting? This has taken a long time for polar scientists to go into the field and analyze and things of that nature. But if we can take thousands of these images 
and put them through our AI algorithms, we can actually move the needle a little bit. So with this, I've shared several of these scientific examples that we are working on, where we are making progress in applying data science and AI algorithms. But there's a lot of opportunity for all of us. Not only can we do AI, data science algorithms in computer vision, spatiotemporal algorithms, data mining, anomaly detection, but there's a lot of social constructs as well where each of us can make an impact. There's things like human trafficking, climate migration that's happening as we speak. As the sea levels rise, communities are disrupted, communities are displaced, and that's resulting into major social impacts. Each of us can look at those types of problems and make an impact. There could be scenarios where ethical and responsible AI elements will come in, social justice elements come in, so that not only are we looking at where the impact is happening, but where the impact originated. How is this chain of events impacting climate at different locations? Where is the use and where is the impact? How do we connect those dots in terms of social justice elements? So there's lots of different scenarios that you can look at. And then of course there's this element of mis and disinformation. Anytime you talk about climate change, there are situations where there will be believers and non-believers, and there'll be discussions on different science elements you find, especially as we have some uncertainty in the predictions that we are making. How do we validate the information that we are consuming and we are putting out as well? So information, misinformation, disinformation is again on all of us. How do we validate information as we become consumers of this information as well? And that is what will drive the research and education in this area, in my opinion. So with that, I want to thank you for listening, and I welcome you to visit iHarp and join us in moving the needle. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Janeja. <laughs> Professor Ayiri Yoshioka was born in Japan and came to the US at the age of 12. She studied violin at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music before going on to get a BA in English from Yale. But ultimately, she received a Doctor of Music Arts from Juilliard. She's the founding member of the Duo Dei Luna, Damocles Trio, and Voyager Ensemble, and has performed and recorded with the members of the Emerson, Brentano, and Arditi Quartets. A long time ago, I occasionally ventured into playing classical music on radio shows that I had in Cleveland and on Ann Arbor. And I also subbed for radio shows focused on classical music. I had a bias towards Latin American composers from several years learning to play classical guitar. I spent a good deal of the last week listening to Dr. Yoshioka's 2015 album, Sueños Mysticos, with John Novacek. It features music by Latin American composers. It made this homecoming week of this mostly spectacular weather that much more special that my GridX assignment introduced me to her music. The most compelling quote I have read on that album is that her playing constitutes beautiful, beautiful lyricism with an unfailingly lovely tone incisive rhythmic security, and a sense of joy in meeting the technical challenges. Even better than that review, I'm honored to introduce to Grit X, Dr. Yoshioka and her violin. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One of the perks of being a musician is that we get to travel around the world. So here I am in the Gobi Desert on, at the foothills of a sand dune, and my audience are the nomadic people of Mongolia and the horses that brought them in equal numbers. As musicians, we get to travel physically, but we also get to travel in our imaginative world. As a child, I moved back and forth between Japan and the United States, and I was always fascinated with how my cultural heritage played a role in who I am and how that might inform me as a musician. Being an interpreter of both traditional and contemporary repertoire, my main aim after I learn the bulk of the notes and what's on the page is to get inside of the composer's life and mind and heart. What was the composer experiencing when they wrote the work? What were their emotional state? What was going on historically? Those are the, all, all the questions I ask myself. And for the purposes of this presentation, how does the cultural background of the composer manifest themselves in their music? 
This has been a central path of my research for a number of years. There are many ways in which a composer could represent their cultural language in their music. In this excerpt that you're about to hear, you will hear composer Zarina Mirshikar, a composer from Tajikistan, explore scale patterns and melismatic long song form using Western instruments, namely violin and piano. This is from, uh, this recording is from my upcoming solo CD, Music from Central Asia. Circling back to my own background and cultural heritage, I was curious about how music of composers from Japan, especially the ones that chose to leave Japan and came west, whether in the US, Europe, how their music illuminated Japanese aesthetics. They can appear in many different forms. It can be in the usage of the instruments, for example, employing koto, Japanese zither, or shakuhachi, the Japanese bamboo flute, or using compositional techniques of Japanese court music. As I researched about this further, and this actually became my doctoral dissertation topic, an overarching theme, concept of ma, appeared in all of the works I studied. I could be here for another three hours if I decide to delve deeply into that topic, but if I had to narrow it down to one sentence, it is the awareness and placement of time and space. Concept of ma appears in all forms of art, dance, theater, literature, visual arts, architecture, and we Japanese recognize it in our daily lives. In music, it can appear in the form of playing around with passage of time and repose. In this next excerpt you're about to hear from Wave Mechanics 2 by Karen Tanaka, you'll hear punctuated chords against shimmering fast notes and how that plays into Karen Tanaka's concept of time and repose. This is from a um, CD of my collection of works, electroacoustic works by women composers. And this particular performance is from Lausanne, Switzerland. <laughs>
We're now moving on to Argentina. As mentioned earlier, one of the tasks of being an interpreter musician is to go inside the life of a composer. In this next work, I imagine myself sitting in the living room of composer Pablo Ortiz. Pablo writes, when I was 14 years old, my uncle, who at the time was going through a very tango-esque divorce, moved into my parents' house, bringing with him his record collection. Every afternoon, he sat and listened to his tango records, reminiscing about happier times. For Pablo, the many hours of listening to tango music with his uncle informed his tango and milonga-inspired works. We all recognize how our memories play a role in who we are and our consciousness. We can, our surroundings, our experiences, our language, the festivities we embrace, the food we eat, they all inform and are inextricably tied to how we think, how we feel, how we act, and how we produce. Thank you all so much for taking a musical journey around the world with me. We're making one more stop, and uh, I'll be playing Sentimental from Five Little Milonguitas by Pablo. This is from, as was mentioned, uh, my Sueños Mystico City works uh, from, by South American composers. And as you listen to this performance, I hope that you'll take one last trip with me to Pablo's living room with his uncle in Buenos Aires in 1990s. I'm uh, glad to welcome you to the uh, second round of GridX 2022. And these are our speakers, but I'm going to ask our second moderator to come out. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Kimberly Moffat, who is the Dean of our College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Kimberly. You're up. <laughs> This is what happens when you ask a talker to introduce people. I'm sorry, I was still talking. Oh, I'll, I'll give it to you in a second. Okay. Welcome. Um, I have the pleasure of first introducing Dr. Alicia Lynn Wilson, Esquire, who is an alum, but also a graduate of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences and Political Science. She is currently the Vice President of Economic Development for Johns Hopkins University and Associate Professor in the Hopkins Bloomberg School for Public Health 
and the Hopkins Carey Business School here in Baltimore. At Hopkins, Alicia leads a core cross-institutional cross team focused on developing and implementing Hopkins institution-wide strategies and initiatives as an anchor institution in and around its campuses both within the United States and abroad. Prior to joining Hopkins, Alicia served as the Senior Vice President of Impact Investments and Senior Legal, legal Scholar, uh, Counsel to the Port Covington Development Team, where she ensured that the $5.5 billion Port Covington Development Project generated a measurable beneficial social and environmental impact alongside the financial return of its equity investors. Alicia also served as the principal negotiator of the tax increment financing, known as TIF, legislation, and the two largest community benefit agreements in the history of Baltimore associated with the passage of the $660 million TIF bill, the largest TIF awarded in the history of the United States at that time. For her accomplishments and public service, Alicia has received numerous awards and honors. Most recently, she received the 2021 Humanity of Connection Award from AT&T for her commitment and leadership in advancing anchor strategies that elevate and expand communities through economic development, healthcare, and education. She was also recognized in 2021 by Black Enterprise Magazine as one of the 40 leaders under 40 who are, quote, changing the world at local, national, and global le levels. Alicia is a proud graduate here at UMBC, as well as the University of Maryland, Francis Key Carey School of Law. Please, let's welcome her. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am so honored to be able to talk to you on the topic of community building with materials that are stronger than brick and mortar. Uh, as Dean Moffitt said, I have been privileged over the course of my short career uh, to be able to have been a part of some of the largest redevelopment projects in the United States. And over the past 10 years, to have overseen $10 billion in redevelopment projects associated with uh, community benefits agreements as a part of those agreements, as a part of those deals. And as I think back on how I became a part of the construction industry, I really came to some real realization of a really poignant fact. And that's that all of us are part of the construction business, whether you want to be or not. Um, many of you may say, I don't think I wear a hard hat to school to work every day, and I certainly don't wear any construction boots. But I dare say that all of us are engaged in the community building enterprise. And you actually are engaged in that work every single waking hour of the day, whether you want to be or not. And so I think that as the master architects, of your own construction enterprise, it's really important to me to think about what sort of materials would you utilize and should you be utilizing as a part of your construction um, enterprise. And I'll tell you about why I chose the materials that I chose when I was doing community building and continue to do community building today. In the literal construction context, my work on construction projects has taught me that all construction materials are not equal. In fact, there are superior materials that build with, and we see them all around us. If you look in this building, there's brick everywhere, really because brick is a really important material. It has certain characteristics that allow for individuals to know that they can rely upon brick and mortar to really be undergird the foundation that they set when they talk about building a physical building. The four reasons are simple. Brick and mortar is energy efficient. It holds well. It's an insulated product. It um, is able to hold heat. It also is able to hold in coolness. It is able to really be a great conductor in that manner. And you are able to save money on really the, the um, 
the heat and the, and the air that you might utilize in that building. It's also durable. Brick and mortar buildings that we see for centuries, they stand the test of time. They're able to withstand both the physical elements and even those who might want to demolish or take them out. Bricks are sustainable. Um, they, are, they are renewable. You can take bricks from one project and put them onto another project. There are companies across the world that take bricks from Baltimore and move them to Florida to be utilized in other construction projects. And bricks are non-flammable. They can't light up very easily. They're able, they're not like um, wood that is easily combustible. It's very hard to burn brick. And so in the same way, in the community building context, I was able over the course of my career as in, in economic development, understand how important it is to build in the community building context with materials that in many ways mimic the qualities of brick, that are durable, energy efficient, are able to withstand the test of time, and are able to last much longer than um, the individuals who are involved in them. So I'm going to talk to you on how. This is the time you might want to take out those notepads and take some lessons down. It's simple five principles that I rely upon in my community building context. My first principle is consistency is key. In the community building context, it is very natural to want to make contact and want to build relationships when you need them. When the time is for you to be able to call on that individual, call on those community partners. We have a project that we really need to bring you in on. But the time to build those relationships isn't when you need them. It's well in advance. And it's over, it's about being consistent. Uh, in the context of being able to negotiate the largest community benefits agreement in the history of Baltimore, the relationships that allowed for me to be able to negotiate the, that agreement were forged decades before I ever sat at the negotiating table. It was that my trust was built from my words matching my actions over a series of several years. And so when I went into the negotiating table, I didn't have to forge the relationships or build the trust that uh, ordinarily you would have to build. It's because people knew that my community building was consistent, consistent with the words that I was speaking at that table, consistent with the actions that I had already demonstrated well before that. And the second was that I was really good at being able to think about building across generations. You know, it is really attractive to go to the young ones. They're so cute. You, who wouldn't be attracted to going there vibrant? They have such great energy. But it's also important to be able to connect with the elders in the community and to think about how do they contribute. They're cute as well. Um, and everyone in between. Really not being discriminating about thinking about where does the power come from or where does influence come from? Because it can come from anywhere. And the reality is that everyone is connected, whether you can see those lines or not. And they talk to one another. And going back to the consistency is key. If you connect across generations, you actually engage in what I call the multiplier effect of impact, where your community connections with one generation are literally passed down to other generations because of your deep and your authentic relationships. The next is to associate with those who deliver. In the community building context, let me tell you, everyone is a community organizer and everyone is an influencer but there are a few people who deliver on that. And so as you think about how do you build across within community, it's important to not be attracted to those who are self-anointed leaders, those who people tell you that's the, that's the person you must get to know because they're the person that has the phone number of the politician or the, or the, or the um, influencer. It's the people who can deliver on what they say. It's the people who are able to to then take the words that they say at the table and actually deliver results. Be attracted to those people and align yourself with those people, and I promise you'll be able to build the community. The fourth principle, 
really one that I'm going to stay in for a second, is that a single transaction does not equate to a relationship. As we think about the first point that I talked about, consistency is key. This also goes into the single transaction not being a relationship. As you think about community building, you can engage in a number of seemingly un, um, unassociated uh, transactions with people. But the reality is, is you have to see the line between how do I dig deep and understand what motivates people, what's inspiring them, what's keeping them at the table that is beyond the dollars and cents, beyond their job title. And that takes digging deep in the relationship. When I negotiated the largest TIF in, um, in United States history, I spent a great deal of time, as you probably can imagine, eating with the individuals in the community, going to their community events, meeting with them in their homes, and not talking about the topic that was of most interest to me, but actually engaging with them about the topic that was most interest to them. It was their families, it was their children, it was their hopes and dreams. It was the things that kept them up at night. And we spent more time talking about those things because what I knew is that the transaction that we were engaging in would come and go. There would come a point when we would all sign on the dotted line. And for you all, as you engage in community building, and there are many times when you get to sign on the dotted line. But that's not where the work ends. It's actually where the work begins. And so as we think about how we think, how we are able to have a, a impact that goes far beyond the actual single transaction, it's only going to occur if you have a relationship. And so while there are many things that may pull on your time, many things that may pull on your interests, I will tell you the time you dedicate to going deep in relationship will pay huge dividends and will allow for you to actually have the community building that you so desire. And principle five is to give before you receive. In many contexts, it is very easy to be a taker. There's a, I, um, I often say, in a world full of takers, the givers always win. When you think about community building, there are many instances when you are in a position of authority or power to really be able to exert that power to take. It is in those instances where you have to think about how can I give before I ever will need to receive? And that means that you have to really know the individuals that you're meeting with. You have to dig deep. That's why you have to be able to engage in a really deep connection with them to figure out what keeps them up at night. What is it that's motivating their heart? What is it that you can do to fulfill their dreams? And as you do that, you will be fulfilling your own dreams as you think about how you are community are uh, being a part of their community. I know I said that you that brick and mortar, uh, there are principles that are stronger than brick and mortar. And I dare say if you follow the five principles that I talked about today, you will not only negotiate the largest community benefits agreements in the in the city of Baltimore or the largest tax increment financing um, deals you'll be building a community that all of us can be proud of and that you can ultimately be able to come back to with confidence that it will support you in all of your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Minzong Kiang. She is a chemical biophysicist and an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at UMBC. Dr. Kiang's research contributes to seek cures of irregulated metabolism in living systems, to understand how metabolic activities are altered by cellular environments or small molecules. Her work visualizes and analyzes multidimensional dynamics of metabolic networks in living cells and tissues. Currently, her lab is studying 4D networks between glucose metabolism and mitochondria by using various biophysical and biochemical tools. Dr. Kyung received her master's from Iwa Women's University in South Korea and her PhD from Penn State University. 
Her postdoctoral work with Professor Steven, uh, Stephen Chu and Exo Brunger were, uh, was performed at Stanford University and at the University of California, Berkeley. And then she joined UMBC in 2012. She has been awarded grants by NIH and BD2K Initiative Innovation Lab for her research here at UMBC. Let's welcome her. Okay, so I would like to thank Dr. Moffitt for the introduction and also um, Carr for this great opportunity. Great to see you guys. Um, have you guys ever had this question that, can I eat these delicious donuts and not gain weight, right? <laughs> <laughs> if we know what really happened to those sugar we eat, probably we can find the answers, right? Sugars, once we eat, they turn into glucose in our mouth and gut. And then cells uptake those glucose to process through the glucose metabolism to produce essential, various essential molecules for us to survive. Not surprisingly, glucose metabolism is directly linked to many diseases such as cancer, dementia, heart disease, aging, not to mention diabetes and obesity. But today, most of what we know about the glucose metabolism is from the studies with enzymes in the test tubes, instead enzymes in cells. While we've learned a lot from the previous research, but how the glucose metabolism really works in the living cells has remained mysterious. So today, I am here to tell you that my research at UMBC has discovered these mysterious mechanisms with our collaborators. This is the map showing networks of the metabolic pathways. There are more than 3,400 enzymes involved in this. Every single enzyme performs very specific chemical reactions. And in many cases, series of the enzyme reactions are required to get their job done. And one of them is the glucose metabolism, as shown in the red box. If we look at it more closely, glucose metabolism has two pathways. One is the glycolysis that produces pyruvate from glucose, gluconeogenesis that forms glucose from the pyruvate. In glycolysis, there are 10 enzymes, and then they perform the series of the enzyme reactions. Then let's think about how these enzymes take place, I mean, how this glycolysis takes place in the cells. All 10 enzymes exist in the cytoplasm. And for the, it's, it makes sense them it makes sense for them to organize to perform the series of the enzyme uh, reactions like this. However, enzymes don't know how to line up, right? So in the cytoplasm, they randomly distributed. The more problem is that the cytoplasm is really crowded. Numerous biomolecules are packed in the space. So for them to efficiently communicate each other, it's not possible. The series of the reaction is going to be very difficult. But somehow, cells manage it to have a very efficient and well-regulated glycolysis. Right? So that was the question that scientists had puzzled so long. How this glycolysis and gluconeogenesis can happen efficiently and well-regulated way, right? So to find the answers, we monitored those enzymes in the living cells using fluorescence microscope. And these are the cells, how they look like under the fluorescence microscope. Green area shows the cytoplasm, and inside the green area, as you can see, very bright yellow spots there. Those yellow spots are the compartments 
that are composed of multiple enzymes for glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. These compartments are not bound with the membrane, not like, not like the nucleus or the mitochondria. And then the concentration of the enzymes in the compartments is really high. They go up to 20 times compared to the, their concentration outside of the compartments. Because of the high concentration of the enzyme, the communication between enzymes are much easier and then so that they can perform the series of the chemical reactions. So basically, these compartments are the society of enzymes for the glucose metabolism, right? But then cells are three-dimensional entities, and they keep responding to the foods that we eat and stresses that we encounter. So to study them better, we built this unconventional microscope in my lab. This microscope can visualize very small features inside the living cells in four dimensions. So when we put our cells in, under the, this microscope, they look like this. These green little features are glucosome. A shows a whole cell. B, C, D shows the three-dimensional zoomed in image of those rectangles inside the A image. When glucosomes are small, submicron scale, they are sphere, as shown in D. When they are large, they are micron scale, then they have a various shapes, and they constantly change, like as shown in B and C. If we look at them in 4D, sometimes they, we can see that they collide each other and merge to form a larger glucosomes. And, these gluco and then these green arrows are pointing at the merging events. And the glucosomes rap rapidly respond to the changes of the cellular environments. So for example, if we apply high salt concentration in their media, then while cell volumes decrease, the glucosome formation is promoted so that their amount is increased. Then the next question that we had how these glucosomes are going to communicate with other metabolic pathways. So we specifically studied the communication with the, the mitochondria and, the, and glucosome. So the final product of the glycolysis is pyruvate. That is the fuel for the mitochondria. And as you know, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So their communication controls the cell's life. So we visualized glucosome and the mitochondria simultaneously in the living cells. Green shows glucosome, red are the mitochondria. As you can see visibly, glucosomes are nearby mitochondria. With our specialized microscope, we can quantitatively measure their 3D distances between glucosomes and mitochondria. In this graph, the highest population of glucosome touches mitochondria. If we look at them in 4D, although they are really dynamic, their contact between glucosome and mitochondria are maintained. Also, the closer the glucosomes are to mitochondria, the stronger functional link between them. And the glucosome sizes are related to their function as well. This means that not all glucosomes have the same function in a cell. Their locations and their sizes determine their function. And glucose, mito glucose metabolism not only networked with the mitochondria, it has networked with the many other metabolic pathways. So maybe at a different location with the different sizes, these glucosomes may network with the other metabolic pathway as well, like this. So I believe understanding these networks, how, how, under, how these networks are regulated in 4D, holds a key to find new strategies for developing drugs of many, many metabolic diseases. And finally, in the future, 
I believe that we can eat these delicious donuts as many as we want without worrying to getting diabetes and obesity. Thank you. Our last speaker for this session is Dr. Matthew Fagan. He is a geographer, ecologist, and associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems here at UMBC. Dr. Fagan's research focuses on conservation and restoration in human-dominated landscapes. To understand how forests and crop fields are changing over time, his work integrates ecological field data with the analysis of satellite imagery. Presently, his lab is studying forest degradation and restoration in Maryland, Central America, Peru, and India. He collaborates with a variety of conservation partners, including the World Resources Institute, the McGaw Recovery Network, and Conservation International. Dr. Fagan received his master's from Dartmouth College and his PhD from Columbia University. His dissertation work evaluated forest conservation efforts outside protected areas in northern Costa Rica. Before joining the UMBC faculty in 2016, he completed a NASA postdoctoral program fellowship at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Matthew is the author of more than 30 scientific papers and is currently working on monitoring the global expansion of, of tree crops using machine learning. Let's welcome him. Excellent. Um, thank you, Dean Moffitt, and thank you, Carl, for inviting me. Uh, I'm just really excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm here today to tell you about something that you may have guessed from the introduction that is near and dear to my heart, forest restoration and reforestation. And um, I took, hang on, they, they, they armed me for this presentation, so I have to get up my arm. And I'll, I won't point this in the audience. Um, oh, first slide. I took this picture 20 years ago of a regrowing pasture in Costa Rica. And to me, it says something that is inspiring. I think we all admire the ability of nature to recover given time. Um, and sometimes, nature needs a bit of a jump start, and that's where tree planting comes in. Now, tree planting is having something of a moment. Um, it is in almost an international mania. It is seen as one of the top solutions, potentially, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, to securing carbon, pulling it out of the atmosphere. So um, countries around the world are proposing to make green walls to hold back the desert to restore degraded soils to produce timber. But the reality is a bit less um, photoshopped. You may notice these are the exact same photo. They're both on the internet. Um, you can see if you look in this photo that most of the trees that were planted were dead. The only ones that have survived are along the roads and they're dwarfed or stunted. And these trees are planted in an ecosystem where they never belong. It's super dry there, as you might expect, given the desert in the background. So today I want to talk to you about how tree planting is not a wonder drug. It does have side effects. And to tell you about some of those issues and how we can do better. So as a geographer, I love the idea that maps can change the world. And in this case, it actually happened, believe me or not. So the net message of these two maps here, which was published in 2011, one in 2019, is that we have between a billion and two billion hectares of potential land to be planted. All the areas in green behind me are areas that could be planted with, to restore forests. It's vast areas of the earth. Think of like three Indias put together for one billion. So these maps got people excited. And what happened is countries around the world started doing voluntary pledges. And 350 million hectares is slightly larger than India. I'm using India as a scale of measurement. This is very close to being met. These voluntary pledges, 350 million hectares by 2030. It's pretty soon now. And countries, this spread to the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, which is now. And continental-level programs like the Initiative 20 by 20 in Latin America 
after 100. And China has been planting for 30 years now. They've built this great green wall they want to expand. Um, in Africa, several countries in Africa have proposed a great green wall of Africa, which is going to stretch, I believe it says 7,000 kilometers and be 11 million hectares. So if you're trying to think about that, how big that is, I'll give you some slides later. That's like the size of Central America. So huge areas, and countries got excited, and then nonprofits got excited as well. And a lot of them popped up to plant trees. Some old nonprofits got involved. There are no fewer than three trillion trees nonprofits to plant trees. And excitement bred companies getting into the action too. This is a credit card that will offset your carbon footprint by engaging these nonprofits to plant trees in your behalf. How many of you have ever seen a give us a dollar to plant a tree program? I see a few hands in the audience. You can go do it at the gas station when you check out, offset your carbon emissions. And it's even appeared on TV. This is John Oliver from Last Week Tonight. If you don't know the program, it's wonderful. And you know he just loves carbon emissions. Not really. No, if you know Last Week Tonight at all, anything John Oliver talks about, he talks about how there are problems with it. And the problems here come that there's very little ways to tell that companies are actually carrying through and the trees are surviving and growing. So this allows companies to claim that they are offsetting their emissions without actually doing anything to reduce their emissions. And it's rife with basically cheating and what they call greenwashing, making their image look better. So I want to talk to you about the side effects of tree planting. Because when you think about tree planting, and this is great for the environment. I'm not anti-tree planting, but there are lots of issues to consider that aren't commonly brought up. The first one I want to talk about is that failure and displacement are common. So tree, most tree planting projects, the majority of them, are complete failures. The most tree planting they've ever done in an hour, a million trees in an hour, all of them are now dead. Right? I went, went back and checked 10 years later, they're all gone. Why is that? Well, people live in these places. This is a scientific debate, but it's a real life issue. This is a plant restoration project in Madagascar. It is now on fire because a farmer nearby used fire to clear their fields, and this restoration project burned down. So farmers are also often displaced by tree planting projects when they're successful and not always properly compensated. So because people live in these places and actually getting land to do restoration is really hard, I wanted to ask, are these global forest restoration pledges feasible? And the short answer is no, no they're not, right? A third of countries pledged 10%, more than 10% of the area. One country pledged 80% of the area, which would be like the lower 48 states all committed to being planted. Um, the average is 2 million hectares, which is the size of El Salvador, right? So maybe you don't have El Salvador fixed in your mind. El Salvador was more conservative. They pledged 1 million hectares, which turns out to be, of course, half the country devoted to restoration. How are they going to produce food? Where were the cows graze? These are questions left. So this is an issue. And if you look at El Salvador a little more closely, El Salvador just recently reported that it's made one-tenth of the way there. It's got 10 years left on its commitment and it's had 10 years since it made its commitment, it's only gotten 10% of the way. So it's not working so well. And in fact, when you look at their countries, less developed countries actually committed more area. So we look at how much area they actually planted now versus how much they pledged. And this blue line says they've committed to double their area, which is pretty ambitious if you ask me. But over here, El Salvador pledged to triple its area of planted crops planted trees. Super ambitious. And you may notice the colors get redder the further up here you go. So after accounting for a few factors about countries, we find that less developed countries, for a variety of reasons, are committing to these vast areas which may not be feasible for them to do. Finally, and this is a really critical point, a quarter of countries lost more habitat in the previous 15 years than they committed to restore in the next 15 years. So they're losing tons of forests, which they cannot replace, often old growth, and pledging to plant trees in those areas. So, and really, that's gonna be challenging to keep those trees alive. Another side effect of tree planting that seems counterintuitive is it often causes habitat destruction, particularly in dry areas. Now, this is often called the tyranny of trees and grassy biomes. It's a cultural bias. We often look at grassy or sparsely treed areas like, ooh, that area is degraded and really messed up by people. But this ugly thorn forest, grass in between, 
is a very diverse ecosystem. And in India, this is an actual picture taken by my colleague Forrest Fleischman. They bulldozed it and replaced it with a eucalyptus plantation. So you can imagine this is not good for the environment and sequester more carbon. It was just to plant trees. So there's a cultural issue here. But I also was looking at the maps, the map A and map B I showed you in the beginning. I thought, huh, a lot of the area in this map, in yellow here, those are the drylands, has, it's marked out for restoration. And I thought that's really strange because those landscapes often have trees already. And in fact, when we used a database of satellite imagery and counted a lot of trees, all the areas in red in these two maps, this is map A and map B, are areas where there already were trees. There is no room for additional trees. These wooded drylands do not need restoration. We realized that happened because they were using satellite imagery forest maps built on satellite imagery that was just not detecting the trees. So when it saw this landscape here, it said there's 0% tree cover, and they argued we should plant some trees there. But there's no need. Now, the final side effect of all these commitments to restoration are that a lot of them are to put in monoculture plantations. About half of the commitments are to put in monoculture plantations. And a lot of the company commitments are to put in monoculture plantations. And this is a plantation of eucalyptus in Brazil. Uh, Brazil is one of the, the largest producer of wood just ahead of the US from plantations. But we have no way of tracking plantations. So they can go in anywhere. They can replace rainforests. They can replace savannas. We have no way to know until very recently. And that's why this last year, I helped produce um, one of the world's first maps of, this is actually, I guess, the world's first map of tree plantation expansion. Sounds very weird to say it that way, but it is. Um, and you can see there are a lot of plantations that have regrown in southern Brazil, a lot in Southeast Asia. And plantations are red here, and natural forests are blue. You can kind of see the pattern in Southeast Asia. So we found that plantations made up half of recent regrowth in the tropics. Um, in 14% of those plantations were planted in areas where they shouldn't have been, in drylands, basically destroying habitat. And actually, if we look at the rainforest parks, which are near roads, um, one in every 11 parks has a plantation that's occurring inside of it, usually because it was clear, the rainforest was cut down, and they planted something on top of it. it seems like a strange thing to say, but I thought I would show you two quick examples. Here are the grasslands of southeastern Colombia. These are the Llanos over here. And this is a picture of the plantations for vegetable oil, oil palm. They were planted, all these little red blocks represent oil palm plantations. And that's for food and shampoo. If you read your shampoo, sodium laureth sulfate is basically a derivation of this. Or if you like junk food, it's mostly oil palm, Nutella oil palm. If you like tires, and we all do, you need natural rubber. And natural rubber plantations are expanding globally. Here's Nigeria in a rainforest park just outside a city, one of the major cities in the country. This park is a heavily protected park that is now invaded by an oil palm and rubber plantation. And so the rainforest that was there, now here, looks like that now. So this is a serious issue. But before I go, I want to leave you with three thoughts. Tree planting is a wonderful thing, but we need to protect before we focus on restoration, because we can never replace old growth forest. What's more, we can, in order to protect those new forests, like you saw in that Madagascar example, we have to protect the forest in general. You can't just plant trees and expect them to survive. So all these countries with really green ambitions, these developing countries, they first need help controlling deforestation because their deforestation rates are generally very high. Second, dry lands are at risk of overplanting uh, by governments and by unregulated corporations. Tree planting and carbon offsets are the wild west right now and sorely in need of regulation. And finally, informed consumers have power. So all these plantation maps will hopefully enable consumers to know when their vegetable oil is come from a burnt rainforest. Um, and with that, I'd like to say that I'm not against tree planting. I think tree planting is a powerful tool, like all powerful tools that can be used for good or for ill. And if we truly want to restore the planet by planting trees, we need to do better. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce our moderator, Dr. William LaCourse, who is the Dean of our College of Natural and Mathematical Sciences. Bill?
You have any mic here? There we go. I love the way the lights work. I can't see any of you. Uh, first thing I do is take a, just a few seconds here to thank Carl uh, for all the effort he puts into putting GridX on. Uh, he'll start thinking about next year, tomorrow, or maybe even after this, uh, as he goes forward, and he puts a lot of time and effort, and it's, uh, it always is a great show. So thank you, Carl. Uh, I have the pleasure this afternoon to introduce Dr. Caitlin Sattler, who is an investigator and in chief of the section on immunoengineering at the National Institutes of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering at the NIH. Thought I'd simplify that and keep a few nationals and institutes out of it. Dr. Sattler completed her undergrad degree in biological sciences at UMBC, then studied the role of T cells in biomaterial mediated muscle regeneration at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine for her PhD followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Sattler is the recipient of quite a few awards, including a TED fellowship, was listed on the 2019 Forbes 30 and under 30 list in science, and in the 2021 MIT Technology Review of 35 innovators under 35 list. She also received the NIH Director's Award for Mentorship and for her work on COVID-19 wherein she led a team to detect 17 million undiagnosed SARS-CoV-2 infections after the first wave of the pandemic in the U.S. In 2022, she was named a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science degree from UMBC. She continues her research on immunoengineering at the NIH working on the next generation of therapeutics for traumatic injury and medical device implementation. Today, she'll be presenting on the many phases of immune cells, building back tissues after trauma. And although she can't be with us in person today due to some prior commitments, she did come here earlier and was on the stage, and she filmed and, or taped the grid X for all of us to see. So I'll leave her film to go. Our immune system is immensely powerful. It runs throughout our entire body. It touches every single organ within us. And it's important every minute of every day of our lives, from simple things like grabbing the handle on the metro on your way to work, to pushing the button in an elevator to get up to your floor, to get to your office, after you've sat down in your chair, when you start typing your emails and touching your keyboard, even just sitting and breathing, our immune cells are working to fight off bacteria and viruses, preventing infections from happening and preventing damage to occur to our bodies. Even alone, our immune cells patrol our bodies for cancer, pulling out different cells that might become cancerous or are headed that way and prevent tumors from forming. And that's just when everything's working properly. When things don't work well, our immune system can stop functioning. It can let those bacteria pass. We can have things like immunodeficiency, but we can also have things the other way, and our immune cells can act too strongly and start to damage our own tissues. When we first learn about immunology in our lecture halls as we're sitting with our textbooks, we're taught in the context of infections, viruses, bacteria, a fungi, but our immune cells play a really important role and are beyond just our body's defenders. They actually act in things like wound healing and not just preventing those infections, but healing that tissue, laying down new skin to help heal back what had been damaged. So one question that I've been having for a very long time is that how our body knows not to attack itself during an injury. Your skin is not supposed to be cut open, so how does our body know to heal that back and not accidentally damage itself? Before we are born, our immune cells are trained to recognize our own cells and tissues through a phenomenon known as self-tolerance. Our immune cells are tolerant of our own cells and tissues. And we know that there are different mechanisms by which this keeps itself up into adulthood to make sure that our bodies stay and are working in concert with our immune system. However, there are rare cases in which this self-tolerance breaks. And this can happen due to excessive inflammation from viruses and bacteria. It can also happen due to mutations in our genetics. 
This leads to that overactivation of the immune system and having cells start to act against our own, um, our own bodies in a phenomenon known as autoimmunity. And this can damage skin, it can damage nerve, it can damage muscle, it can even lead to death. So why, in an injury where we have dirt, we have bacteria, we have viruses, we have damaged tissue, we have all of this inflammation, why does our body not start to attack itself? Imagine a motorcycle rider out for a ride, hits some loose gravel on the road, falls over and slides. The rider now has an abrasion and a laceration. They survive, but they've got an injury. The second that injury happens, there is a cascade of immune responses that occurs, preventing that bacteria from taking hold into an infection and cleaning up that damaged tissue. Then it goes on to lay down collagen, a scar to help seal our body away from the outside world. So our laboratory was interested in these different immune cells that were responding to this injury. And we specifically wanted to look at muscle injuries. So when we looked in the laboratory, we found a wide variety of different immune cells responding to an injury, and they all had different roles. But one really stood out to us, and it's called the dendritic cell. Now why exactly were we interested in these dendritic cells? Importantly, they maintain huge communication with adaptive immune cells. Adaptive immune cells, our T cells and our B cells, form long-lasting immunity, and they also help mediate that self-tolerance. So if we can figure this communication out during an injury, we might start to have targets for therapeutics to help promote wound healing. So let's take a little bit deeper look at these dendritic cells that we find responding to this injury. When we look in the injury and we look at the different types of cells, we find one specific type of dendritic cell that when we treat the, the wound with a material that helps healing, the number of these cells in the injury skyrockets. However, if we instead treat that injury with a material that causes inflammation and scarring, these cells are nearly wiped out from that injury site. We're not the first people to have described this specific type of dendritic cell. It's been reported previously by researchers that have been looking at cancer, but as far as we are aware, we are the first people to have found it in an injury. Now, why should we care about what happens in cancer? So in cancer, our immune cells are what are called self-reactive. So they're reacting to our own cells and our own proteins, ones that have become malignant, ones that have become cancerous. So what we wanted to know was whether or not these dendritic cells were responding to our cells and injury, but in a way that caused our immune system to calm down and not attack our damaged tissue. So what we decided to look at was the communication between these dendritic cells, an adaptive immune cell called the T cell. Our theory was that these dendritic cells were sending some information to calm down the T cells and say, hey, this is me, please do not attack. So we looked at what would happen if we didn't have this specific type of dendritic cell present. And what we found was we took the brakes off. The T cells kind of freaked out a little bit and they activated a whole lot. We saw this in the muscle. We also saw it flowing throughout the blood. Furthermore, in addition to just looking at the immune cells, we of course had to know, well, what happens to the muscle? We see differences in our immune cells. What about the injured tissue itself? So let's take a look under the microscope. So if we look at normal healthy muscle tissue, it looks nice and pink. And then if we look at an injury where we don't have any dendritic cells present, we can see that injury site, but instead of muscle coming back, we wind up seeing fat in the place of muscle. And we also see random muscle fibers that are far from the injury site starting to die. And this is even three weeks after an injury happens. So this suggests that these dendritic cells are actually really important for helping heal these injuries and prevent even more damage from occurring. 
So we know that they're important for helping heal our tissue. How do they get there? If we know how they get there, we can start to target things for therapeutics. When immune cells are responding to a challenge like an infection or an injury, they follow the signal from a protein called chemokines. You can think of chemokines as breadcrumbs. They lead the cells toward that site. And these dendritic cells and these other immune cells follow very specific breadcrumbs, so they know exactly where to go. Unlike me, I will follow any bread. Um, the specific um, breadcrumb that we were looking at was a protein called XCL1. And the reason why we were interested in this was because if we looked at our dendritic cells, they had a receptor that was very specific for that protein. So we wound up looking at our injured muscle versus healthy muscle. And we saw the second an injury happened, we had an increase of this protein. So we found our breadcrumb. The next thing after we followed our breadcrumbs is we need the door. We need the thing that allows those immune cells to come into the injury space. And for that door, we were looking at a protein called e cadherin. This protein helps cells stick together. And the reason that we were curious specifically about this protein was we saw another protein on our dendritic cell called CD103 that binds E cadherin. And so we did exactly what we did with our breadcrumbs. Do we see E cadherin pop up with an injury? And the answer was yes. In healthy tissue, it's not there. When we have an injury, we see this protein appear. So we have our breadcrumbs and we have our door. Now what do we do next? Now that we know how these cells are coming in, our laboratory is working on developing new methods to help modulate the immune response to injury and implantation of medical devices. Our goals are to work with the immune system in a synergistic way to help promote healing of our broken bones and tissues and creating new therapeutics to help us heal our injuries. Thank you. Dr. Sebastian Daphners, an associate professor in physics, received his doctorate in 2011 from the University of Augsburg, Germany, where he was also born and raised. From 2011 to 2014, he was a postdoctoral research associate in the group of Professor Jasinski at the University of Maryland College Park, for which he won a Dodd postdoctoral fellowship. In 2014, he was awarded a director's funded postdoctoral fellowship to work with Dr. Zurich at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Dr. Defner joined UMBC in 2016 and is an internationally recognized leader in quantum thermodynamics and he co-authored the first introductory graduate level textbook in that field. In addition, he has made significant contributions in quantum control and in quantum foundations. He has authored about 100 publications with over 5,100 citation. citations. His work has been recognized by UMBC by awarding him the 2022 CMS Early Career Faculty Excellence Award. His talk will be entitled, The Quantum Universe is Weird, But Our World is Not. Schrodinger's cat is dead, right? Is dead, right? Now, I'm an experimentalist, so usually when I want to know whether Schrodinger's cat is alive or dead in the box, I always ask, how much food did they put in? So, <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Thank you very, uh, for the very, very kind introduction. Well, for the last one and a half hours, I was sitting over there in the audience, and I was listening to my amazing colleagues, and to be honest, I was starting feeling more and more intimidated. And the question that I kept asking myself is, what am I doing here? I'm just a theoretical physicist. And yes, I know I, uh, the stereotype and I appreciate it. So rather than trying to justify why I'm on stage, let me formulate a goal. What is it that I would like you to um, take out of um, well, this 10 minute course on quantum physics? As you might have heard, this tiny prize, this big thing, sometimes called Nobel Award, Nobel Prize, was awarded for groundbreaking experiments in quantum physics. What was that really about? Well, obviously, I won't be able to tell you everything about quantum physics that you would like to know. But maybe, and this is really the minimal goal that I'm hoping to achieve, I will be able 
to inspire you to reflect a little bit more about reality. And what I mean by that is, what is real and how do we know where we are? But let's start very, very simply. What do you see? What is this? Oh, well, it's just a rectangle, right? All right, cool. What do you see now? Boom. What if I told you that both times you were right, while at the same time you're also totally wrong? What do you see now? So what you appreciate here is that depending on the perspective, depending on how you measure, depending how, on how you look at things, you might get very, very different statements that fully describe your reality, your objective reality. However, you might also be losing out on the full absolute truth of the universe because you don't have access to complete information. Why this is really important is, is because most of the physics that we describe, most of what we see around us, is built on experience. Let me ask another question. And Carl, don't worry, I'm not going to actually do it. But let me ask you, what would happen if I threw this remote towards you? <laughs> well, pretty much everyone in the room would make a prediction. Namely, this remote is going to fly somewhere into the audience and hopefully not hit anyone. But appreciate what we're doing here. We're making a prediction for an experiment that has not happened yet. A question that I then always like to ask is, well, how do you know that this is going to happen? Well, the obvious answer is, well, we've seen it before. I have five-year-old twin boys. Um, they're very, very skilled at throwing things at places, and they know exactly um, what's going to happen. But how do they know that? They've never opened um, a book um, on physics. They don't know how to read. But they've seen it before. What we really do is, is when perceiving our environment is, is that we're making predictions for experiments, for events that have not happened yet. And these predictions are based on our experience. Now, if you fully appreciate that, then, not thinking again about my little children, what they have a good understanding for are the things that they can touch, which are about the size of um, uh, their size, that move at speeds that they can perceive, that they can watch, and that are also at um, energy scales, but that means temperatures that they can understand, room temperature. Wouldn't it be very arrogant to assume that what we perceive around ourselves fully describes reality at very short length scales, at very low temperatures, at very low energies, or at very high energies. So why would we assume that cosmological objects like galaxies behave exactly like a remote that I'm throwing into an audience? Why would we assume that atoms that we can't even see with our own eyes behave um, like things that we can touch? Well, the truth is, they're not. It's exactly like the example that I showed you before. We only have access to a certain amount of information. And based on the information that we have, we make a prediction for how things should behave. But the universe is a little bit more complicated than that. Here's a famous example. Most of the perception, most of the measurement that we're taking is carried by light. We've already seen examples today when um, talking. So in particular, when, uh, sorry, looks a little bit weird on the screen here, got confused for a second. But this is exactly what I mean, light. Light carries information. The light, this tells me um, what things should um, look like, tells me something about my uh, reality. Light, the way that we usually perceive it, is a wave. For instance, we had a, um, a earlier, um, when we were talking about music, a uh, work called Wave Mechanics. We saw examples of remote sensing, which means we're literally taking um, pictures of the ground from a satellite. And most of the information that um, is carried, that determines how we make a prediction, is carried by light. This light behaves like a wave. How do we know that it's a wave? Well, you do these double slit experiments, and um, later on, um, when you go outside to the pond, you can do the same experiments. If you throw one rock into um, the pond, you're going to see ripples. That's a wave. If you throw um, two rocks, you're going to see an interference pattern. And that basically just means if, if a maximum of a wave hits another maximum, you get amplification. And if the, uh, one wave is um, oscillating up, the other one is going down, you get destructive interference. That's called an interference pattern. But the Nobel Prize was just awarded for photons, which is apparently light particles. So what is that? Where are the particles in this picture here? Well, the issue is you can perform exactly the same experiment with particles that we understand. If you take a bunch of electrons, real particles, little marbles, and shoot them towards a double slit, what you find is exactly the same interference pattern as you would find when um, performing the experiment with a wave. So how is that possible? Well, it's possible because in this particular um, experiment, we're taking a measurement on the wave properties of um, reality. 
This is often coded in terms of Schrodinger's cat. So I could talk, um, be talking a lot about Schrodinger and um, why he came up with that and different interpretations of quantum mechanics, but none of that actually matters. The only thing that matters is the following. When thinking about Schrodinger's cat, it's not true that classically a being is dead and alive at the same time, but rather that depending on the information that we have, we cannot make a deterministic prediction. So keeping that in mind, how does uh, the Gedanken experiment work? So assume you have a closed box, and inside this closed box you have a cat that was initially alive, stuffed it in. Cat is not going to be very happy, but you put it in there. Next to the cat, there's a little bucket with poison. Choose your poison, um, um, whatever you like. Um, but it should work quick enough that as soon as the bucket is kicked, literally, the cat also kicks the bucket. Now, as long as you haven't opened the box, you don't know whether the cat has kicked the bucket or whether there's some, um, um, in the original experiment, there's some um, complicated nuclear physics um, example of um, when the bucket is going to kick over. But the essence really is that as long as you haven't opened the box, you don't know whether the cat has been um, um, exposed to um, the poison. Now, in old traditional um, interpretations of quantum mechanics, people then often say, yeah, the cat is actually in a um, quantum superposition of being alive and dead at the same time. What does it actually mean? It means nothing. It means that you cannot make a prediction with certainty. It's not like the remote that I'm throwing somewhere and you know exactly where it's going to hit. You don't know what the state the cat is in because you haven't measured. In quantum logic, this is then usually represented as um, what you see on the slide here. In classical logic, the cat is dead or alive, zero or one, black or white, true or false. If you know a little bit of computer um, uh, science, you know that there's um, uh, fuzzy logic, which is somewhere in between, where you can't make a, a deterministic prediction anymore, but you know that with a certain probability, you're either in zero or one, so that's a circle. Quantum reality is actually even more complicated than that, but in this picture, it becomes very easy. The classical world, what we perceive at our length scales, that's zero and one, it's a zero dimensional object, it's just a point, whereas the quantum logic is a two dimensional sphere, so you go into three dimensions. Again, this means nothing else, but we, there's more information encoded in reality than we can usually perceive. Exactly what, what I showed you before with the rectangle, circle, and the cylinder. But now we have a question. If there's more information in the universe that we can perceive, how come that we never see it at all? Let me ask another question. If I asked you know, where do you see me? Where am I? You would probably say that I'm somewhere here on stage. If I asked you, you would tell me, well, I'm somewhere here on stage. And if I asked you, you would also tell me that I'm standing somewhere here on stage. How do you actually know that? How do all three of you know that I'm really here? Well, you've decided that this is a real, that this is um, objective, because you agree on the outcome of the measurement that you have performed. And all three of you have reached consensus. If sufficiently many independent observers agree on the measurement outcome, then this is what we call objective um, reality. But now we need to think through what's really happening, because um, neither of the three of you are actually interacting with me directly. But what's really happening is, this, is that this incredibly bright light up there is shooting photons at me. And of the photons that interact with me, an itsy bitsy tiny fraction is scattered off towards you and you intercept um, uh, these photons. This tiny fraction of the light that is carried from the um, uh, lamp up there, scattered off me towards your eyes. You reach the conclusion that I'm standing right here. And multiple independent observers, all of you, agree on the fact that I'm here. This is objective. This is reality. Now, the question that um, we need to ask, and this is what we do in our work, is trying to understand where does all the quantum information go? So how much of the environment would you have to intercept to see any quantum properties of my being? Well, what you can show us is if you were able to intercept literally everything, all the photons here in the room, you would indeed be able to, um, intercept, um, to reconstruct my full quantum state. But typically, that's not uh, what's happening. And the only um, information that survives the scattering of the photons of objects in the universe, that's the classical information. And this is why it's called um, quantum Darwinism the survival of the fittest information. The classical information is the one that um, survives the interaction. 
Schematically, this is what it looks like. Whenever we talk about classical objects, we have a system sitting somewhere that interacts with a messy, noisy environment, typically photons. Then you have many observers from the outside, and of all the observers on the outside that intercept only a tiny fraction of the environment that the object has interacted with, agree on the state, then it's objectively there. All right, as I promised you, it was a bit of a wild ride through theoretical quantum physics. And um, obviously, I hope I didn't disappoint you too much. I didn't show you a single equation. Of course, this is something that we need to write down in math and um, do complicated things, um, which looks a little bit like speaking in tongues, but none of that really matters. What really matters is the following. The quantum universe, the universe, is a lot more complicated than we perceive based on our experiences that we've made as little children. There's a lot of um, information out there that we do not have access to simply because we didn't evolve um, at energies or length scales where this information was crucial. Our classical reality, what we perceive to be real, is really based on the fact that different observers that take the same measurement agree on the measurement outcome. And the rest of the quantum information that we don't have access to, that's smeared out, that is suppressed by the noisy environment of everything else. Thank you. Dr. Nkiru Naulezi is an associate professor in psychology at UMBC and an affiliate faculty at Yale School of Public Health. She first joined UMBC in 2015. Her research examines the ecological factors that enhance equity within and across the domestic violence housing continuum with an aim to improve the social and material conditions for survivors who occupy multiply marginalized social identities. Dr. Naulezi also seeks to develop sustainable survivor-centered community-based systems of support that can serve as alternatives to traditional social service systems. As an expert in community-based participatory research and a trained facilitator, she designs participatory research processes with community partners to find innovative solutions to complex social problems. I'm gonna read that one more. Innovative solutions to complex social problems. What a noble and worthy area of research to participate in. Unfortunately, probably an endless area of research to do. Dr. Nau Lazy is an award-winning researcher and mentor and has disseminated her scholarship to academic, policy, and community audiences. Her talk is entitled, Sometimes Systems Fail Us, Designing Alternatives for Domestic Violence Survivors. So, why doesn't she just go get help? She could go to call the police, she could get a protection order, she could even go to a domestic violence shelter. At this point, it's getting a little, she should just leave. There's places for her to go. I do research with domestic violence survivors and often, I'm having conversations with people who have very little understanding about how complex it is to actually survive. How difficult it is to actually survive. And I'm reminded of Tasha. When she entered into the research interview with me, she immediately began to describe how her husband had made it literally impossible to stay safe in her home. And she was doing everything possible to keep her child and herself safe. She kicked him out of the apartment. And as instructed by the police, she went to court to get a protection order. He continuously violated that order. He would drive and park in front of her house every night and then follow her to work every morning. You can imagine when she's at work, she's very nervous, very anxious. What is he gonna do? 
She decides she wants to quit her job, but then thinks, I can't afford to be without a paycheck. So she talks to her landlord. Right? She sees if maybe he'll allow her to break the lease without having to pay the fee. She shows him the protection order, saying, look, this is critical. He refuses. OK, how about I move to another unit in the complex? He refuses that, too. She didn't have the money to break the lease. And there was no one in her social networks that could loan her that kind of cash. She also was really hesitant about pushing the issue, given how often she and her neighbors had called the police on her husband. You see, in some counties, when you call the police a certain number of times within a specific time frame, your property is labeled a nuisance. And landlords have the right to evict tenants that are causing a nuisance. And she could tell that the police were already over her anyway. They had told her, look, miss, if you aren't going to leave your husband and go to a shelter, then there's not really anything we can do for you. <sighs> he, you two are legally married. And he has a right to be here because his name is on the lease. OK. Tasha decides to then go to the courts to file for divorce so she can get his name off of the lease. The courts won't let her file divorce papers. Why? Because she needs her husband's signature. And he refuses to sign the papers. So Tasha is caught in this experience. Her husband is not going to stop stalking her. Her landlord is not letting her move. The courts are not letting her get a divorce. And to be honest, she didn't really want to leave her home because it was one of the last affordable housing options in her area. And her daughter, five years old, was having such a time. She didn't want to pick her up and move her into a temporary shelter to further destabilize her. Tasha was caught in this web of instability and insecurity and stress and fear, which made it nearly impossible to try to stay safe. At the end of the interview, she plainly says to me, now I know why they say sometimes systems fail you, because they do. They don't ever listen. And this is where I come in. This is where my work starts. I'm a participatory researcher that co-generates evidence with survivors and community partners about how we can design responses that listen and that contribute to survivors' safety and well-being. One of the most significant findings in my qualitative and quantitative work is that when survivors are experiencing severe violence, they absolutely reach out. This is irrespective of race, irrespective of class, irrespective of gender. Right? The second most important finding from my collection of work is that if a survivor is a person of color, if they are trans, if they are queer, if they are poor, if they are unhoused, if they are someone who has a mental health condition, they are all, I am almost guaranteed to hear that they've had a significantly difficult time accessing resources. So when we think about these two things, people actively seeking out support, and depending on your identity status, you having a very difficult time getting the resources, we rem I am reminded of how important it is to create community responses that are inclusive. And I think we can do that in three different ways. The first thing is to make sure that we can resource community networks. Survivors, in their moments of need, even before they reach out to the police, they're relying on you, neighbors, parents, siblings, co-workers, all of you are their people, and they reach out to their people 
first. When we were talking to survivors about what do you need in this moment, what would be the most helpful thing for you? Someone who is compassionate, someone who picks up the phone and understands, someone who does not judge me. When they also said, it would be also really nice to have someone who understands my lived experience and maybe shares that with me. So talking to other survivors who understand how to navigate abusive partners and oppressive systems simultaneously. So my research team and I are developing a peer survivor advocacy program. Survivors supporting other survivors to generate more research resources for their safety. The second thing that we need to do is to reduce the burden of proof. I recently completed a study with a group of community partners, and we looked at a housing system, a city-funded housing system. One of the most prevailing norms in that system is that survivors are often trying to scam the system. Okay. And what happens is that survivors then have to create more evidence to demonstrate that they were abused. So they had to find protection orders and police reports and eviction notices and bank statements, right, to demonstrate that they were not trying to overuse the system. But what if we build a system that actually trusted survivors? I evaluated an organization that did just that. They had two policies that were based on trusting survivors at their word and making it easy for them to be able to access services. The first policy was called a low barrier policy. What this meant is that the organization did whatever they could to screen survivors in, to reduce any of the barriers that typically come with accessing other services, and said, you're welcome here. This is where you can be. You don't even need to bring your ID if you don't have it. We believe you. The second policy is called a voluntary services policy. And this particular policy says, we can give you housing services, and you don't have to do anything else you don't want to do while you're in this program, right? So what this means is, we can house you, and you don't have to come to the parenting group. We can house you, and you don't have to meet with a caseworker. Right? Survivors have choice to decide how they want to engage in the program and it's not contingent on their ability to stay housed. And so three, we really must focus on creating responses that center survivors' power. The focus of looking at and thinking about responses that allow for choice and freedom for people to decide what they want to do and how they want to do it without the burden of proof. Okay. One of the things that we found in our research is that the more choice that you give survivors in the response, the safer they are, the more empowered they feel. They feel strong, they feel confident, right? They want knowledge, they get resources, they're invested. These are the kinds of things that really create and enhance safety. So let's go back to Tasha. What if Tasha's neighbors came and instead of calling the police again, they knocked on her door. What can we, how can we support you, Tasha? This is what we're hearing. Do you need help putting up security cameras? Do you need us to walk you to your car? Do you want to stay with us anytime something feels unsettled or unsafe? Would you like us to go with you to court? Would that be helpful to you? What if her workplace had a domestic violence policy that said that they would transfer people to other branches if necessary or needed? What if her housing complex had a domestic violence fund? So anytime people needed to transfer units or transfer to other buildings, they could do that without question. What I find is that in situations that feel really insurmountable and complex, and in times where systems are not effectively responding to what people need, Community-based responses that are built on trusting survivors and increasing power 
is always the right path forward. Thank you. So many things in my hand here. So first of all, one more hand, one more uh, big applause for all of our presenters, please. <laughs> my wife and I were recently in Rome, Italy, and it reminded me of one of my favorite movies called The Gladiator. And in it, Russell Crowe said, are you not entertained? So I'm going to ask all of you, are, were you not inspired? Did you not learn anything? And did you not really feel in awe of what we do over here at UMBC? I promise you one more speaker. It is not going to be a 15-minute presentation, but I'm really thrilled uh, to have the honor to introduce our new UMBC president, Dr. Valerie Shears Ashby. <laughs> As, as I think all of you by now know, she joined us about 10 weeks ago. She, she started on August 1st, and uh, after spending about ten, uh, seven years at, as a dean of Duke University's Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. And in that capacity, she led a 700-person faculty spanning over 40 departments. So that's a little larger than UMBC, actually, by headcount, I just want to say. <laughs> For today, I think it's important to know that Dr. Shears Ashby is an accomplished researcher, focused on synthetic polymer chemistry with an emphasis on designing and synthesizing materials for biomedical applications, such as x-ray contrast agents and drug delivery materials. But I don't think she's going to talk about that today. Valerie, can you join us up here? <laughs> UMBC's president, Dr. Valerie Shears Ashby. Thank you so very much. What a privilege it is to be here. These lights are bright. I'm even more impressed. I am even more impressed by our speakers. Um, I, I laughed when I heard the gasp in the back when somebody said that I was here. There are many responses to when people discover that I am here. Um, the gasp is my favorite, probably. Uh, that, that was very special. Um, so thank you all. What an incredible time. Carl, thank you. Um, let's give him a round of applause. and Thank you. And to my deans who, I, I say everybody belongs to me, I put my in front of everything. To my deans who introduced the, our wonderful speakers, thank you so very much. Thank you. And again, just another round of applause for our speakers. They were incredible, really incredible. Uh, so I just, I'm just going to take a moment and tell you what I heard. Um, and I, maybe what I heard is what you heard and maybe not, but it's just a wonderful display of all things UMBC. Um, we started off with talking about uh, an inclusive design to create a searchable museum. That was the real crux of that story, but here's what I heard. I heard words that are so key and so important to the UMBC experience. I heard the words empathy and thinking about context and thinking about access. And I heard this phrase that I love, software with a soul. Uh, that was amazing. And then in the second topic, I heard um, we were talking about understanding the polar ice cap melting by using data science and AI. Um, but I also heard her use words like social constructs and understanding them and the impact on thinking about issues of social justice and mis- and disinformation related to polarized caps, right? Only at UMBC, right? Only at UMBC. And then I heard a talk on worldwide cultural journey through uh, sounds of the world. And you heard the beautiful, beautiful playing uh, by our colleague, but you also heard her talk about this and she used words that were just amazing. She talked about the awareness of place and time, place and space and time and thinking about you don't just play someone's music, but you have to ask questions about where they were and what happened in their lifetimes when they were composing this music, and that helps her to be able to play the music with more integrity. Uh, that was beautiful to me. That was round one, y'all. That was before, that was round one. 
Uh, okay, I'm a nerd, just so you know. Uh, so I, I'm a student at heart, so this was just a day that was fabulous. In the second round of talks, we went from talking about an integrated approach to building genuine community and relationships. And that is a strictly a UMBC thing. That is, that is at the heart, I should say, of what UMBC is. And I love the quote that Alicia used. She said that every human is in the construction business. Golly, that's, you know, that gives us all work to go and do, right? If we're all in the business of building community and making our, our space where we are better, each one of us has an assignment just from that talk. And then in this, uh, the, talk in that second, the second talk in that section was an understanding of chemical processes uh, supported by visualization. So you know all of that chemistry and biology I just loved. Uh, I am a chemist, uh, and I loved seeing all of that. But I watched my colleague do something. She built the microscope. Did you all note the microscope that she built? She built <laughs> the microscope. When there wasn't a solution, she said, I'll create one. And she actually built the microscope. That was phenomenal. And then in that third talk in that second section, it was the ecology of implementing global re reforestation meaningfully. What I loved about that talk, if you missed it, you sh you sh is this going to be on somewhere where people can go back and look at? Oh, beautiful. If you missed reforestation, here's what I got out of that. If you're going to do something, do something that actually works and matters. Right? Don't let people fool you into thinking that action is actually a solution. Movement does not necessarily change things. That's what I heard you say in, on, on, top of, on top of all that beautiful ecology. Um, so I heard that, uh, and that I heard also in that talk that we can do better. I love that. And then we took our last break. Um, and we went on to that third section, and it was beautiful. It was a first a deep look into the immune cell response to traumatic injury. Uh, that was a beautiful discussion. And then we moved on to the strange but compelling world of, quantum, of the quantum universe. I will tell you, I was sitting beside someone who said, that was the most cogent discussion of quantum <laughs> that I have ever heard, right? It was beautiful. Um, I loved watching that. Uh, thank you. I, what I learned is that you're a fantastic teacher. That's what I learned in that section. And then finally, we were in that section, we're closing out with this very important sober topic of finding new alternatives to domestic violence survivors. And in that um, talk, I heard the words how complex, I believe she said, it is to survive. And when I heard that, I thought, I think we're back at the first talk. If you missed the first talk, go back. I think we circled right back to the first talk, and that first talk was on history. And if you know that history, then it might help us understand how complex it is just for some people to survive. Um, and so, what a beautiful day. Um, to me, it was the essence of UMBC. Um, and in all of these talks, I think what you noted is that not only were these people brilliant, but they were people-centric. They were thinking about things that were real and important to each one of our lives being better, the universe being better, our bodies being better, um, and our communities being better. So I cannot have experienced a better first Grid X. I am so excited. This is my first homecoming, my first Grid X. And just thank you to all of you who've made this a wonderful experience. And again, thank you to Carl. Thank you so much.